you would, bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, we come now into your presence by the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask that you now guide us that we might know, understand, and believe in your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So here we are, the Sunday of Pentecost. It swings around once a year, and once a year we concentrate our attention on the Holy Spirit. This day we recognize that it was that day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit made his, so to speak, public appearance within the Word. The Holy Spirit, kind of that silent person of the Trinity, God speaks, the Lord God Father spoke to Moses in the desert. It's Jesus who spoke to the people. But the Holy Spirit, we know, was all behind that. But now he comes to the fore. Pentecost started this way. Started with the disciples huddled like a football team. Eleven disciples, eleven people on a football team. You get it? They were huddled together. And then they went, go get them, team. That's what they did. They prayed. And then the Holy Spirit came and infected them with this wonderful passion for being able to reach out to the world. It was a sound like a rushing wind that came into that place. And then they had what were like tongues of, well, like fire. Don't know what it really was. It may not have been fire. It may have been something else, but it certainly looked like fire. And then the disciples started speaking languages that they didn't know. How that must have felt. And then, they, then other people heard them. And, and they wondered, okay, wow, they're speaking in other languages. What does this mean? So we know that there were Lutherans in the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. And then they tried to define it by saying, these guys are drunk. No, they weren't drunk at all. And then the Apostle Peter, he preaches the very first, well, the very first hymn, uh, sermon on the, the end of the, the world. So he preaches on the end times. That would have been spectacular. And now the Christian church is born. On this day, it's right for us to focus our attention on the Holy Spirit. But we better not leave out what I consider a very important part of Pentecost, and that's the human factor in Pentecost. The disciples, the 11 men who were there, this, this, this Pentecost wouldn't have meant anything without the men. It would have just con continued as the, well, the, what they call it, the Feast of Weeks. So these these men went out and they did what they were ready to do. The men, Simon, his brother Andrew, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas and James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. They were ready for this day, by the way. It was no accident that was happening. Jesus had already prepared them. He did this by choosing them first. You know how it was. The disciples were out fishing, and Jesus came along and said, I want you to be fishers of men. And then there was Philip, who said to his brother Bartholomew, come and Check this guy out. He's pretty exciting. And Bartholomew says, ha, is anybody worth listening to from Nazareth? <laughs> they had been chosen. You know, have you ever been, uh, let me put it this way. When you were a kid and they were picking teams, right? Where were you in the picking order? Right? 
I mean, you desperately didn't want to be last. You wanted to be at least in the middle, or at least the second to last. So here, Jesus chooses these guys, and you would wonder, Jesus, why did you choose these guys? I mean, if I'm picking a team, I'm not going to choose these guys. They, they just didn't hold water. But he chose them. He chose them because they had a purpose, and he knew, he knew what would work in them. So they were chosen. And then they were taught. So for three years, these disciples walked with Jesus. And he told them about the kingdom of the Lord. He taught on a hill. He taught at the temple. He taught with them around the meal table. He taught them on a farmer's field. He taught them about things like kids, that they're a part of the kingdom too. And the Beatitudes. He shared with them that a blessed is not being proud, but it's being humble. Blessed is not seeking strife, but being a peacemaker and the rest of the Beatitudes. And then thirdly, they had been equipped. Equipped. It's in our gospel lesson today. Did you see it? They were equipped with what Jesus called the helper. They weren't alone. And let me tell you, they were going to need it. Jesus says in Luke 10, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. That, I'm sure, was exciting for the disciples to hear that. In Matthew, he says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Boy, they needed a helper. It was going to be tough out there. It was going to be a cold and cruel world that they were going to face (coughs) because they followed Jesus. Martin Luther understood this. He understood what it was going to be like. And he was ready, so to speak. He was equipped. When he stood before the Diet of Worms and he told them that he was not going to recant, this is what he said. I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the council, but it is as clear as noonday that they have fallen into error and even into glaring inconsistency with themselves. If then I am not convinced by proof from Holy Scripture or by cogent reasons, if I am not satisfied by the very text that I have cited, and if my judgment is not this way brought into subjection to God's word, I neither can nor will retract anything. For it cannot be safe or honest for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand, and I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. Luther was equipped to stand against the very pillar of the church the Roman church, but he was equipped because he knew the word of God and because the Holy Spirit was with him. Then the disciples, they were empowered. Jesus had told them in Luke 10, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. But when, and then he says, but when you enter a town and not welcome, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a, as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. So he's telling these disciples, he's empowering them to heal when there was opportunity and not to heal if there was not openness. And then later in Luke 10, we hear the 72 returned with joy. And they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Talk about being empowered. 
They had power over evil. He replied, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. I had given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. When I was in White House, Tennessee, uh, the people in the South have a hard time getting their minds around Lutherans. I, if I hadn't heard it once, I heard it 10 times. You all Catholic? <laughs> there was this wonderful man. He was one of the realtors in town. And he always gave me a hard time. Uh, he, he struggled to know us Lutherans. And he said, do you, do you, guys, do you guys walk on snakes? <laughs> no. And, but he always would say, so how's the snakes today? You trampled on any? <clears throat> You know what? I don't trample on snakes, but I can tell you, I am empowered by the Holy Spirit, by God, by Jesus Christ, to do the very things that he has asked me to do. You see, like the disciples, I contain the light of the world inside of me. These disciples, they were ready because they had been seasoned. Now, what is seasoned? Can you imagine what it was like to be a disciple following Jesus? The authorities were constantly on their backs. There was seasoning that was going on. And then came this extraordinary series of events. Jesus being picked, taken to a trial. It was a sham. And there he was convicted The disciples were off hiding somewhere. He was carried, he carried the cross. They still were hiding. They knew what was going on. (coughs) I'm sure that they were getting fed information all along. Jesus on the cross dying for them who were hiding, for us who are sinners. They were seasoned. And then there was Easter day and they were excited they were excited they knew the fulfillment of what it was to go from the lowest point to the highest point they were seasoned they were seasoned to do what would start at Pentecost they had been sent It was in the locked room of the day of of Jesus' resurrection. Jesus came through that locked door and he said, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. So they had the commissioning of Jesus right there in that moment. They could do what they could do because he said they could do what they were to do. And now... Now, on the day of Pentecost, they are inspired. They are filled with the excitement of the Holy Spirit. They were there to set the world on fire. One person said it this way. Jesus challenged the people, the disciples, to return to their roots and to be what Israel was always meant to be. Not an exclusive nationalistic religion isolated from other nations, but a priestly kingdom serving the Gentiles and leading them to worship the one true God. And so these disciples went out and spoke powerfully about Jesus Christ. They spoke about his atoning sacrifice, that sacrifice that bridges fallen man with a perfect God. They talked about sinners and they talked about being saved. They talked about saints and what it was to get into heaven. They talked about Jesus, who was sacrificed for all people. They talked about his resurrection. These men were ready to do what was going to start on the day of Pentecost. So what about you, Fountain of Life? Where are you with this? Are you any 
less or greater a disciple than the 11? You've been chosen. You sit here, you're chosen. You have been taught. Probably most of you have gone through confirmation. And you probably have been a part of a Bible study. You've been equipped. You have been empowered. You have been sent. You have been seasoned. And you are inspired. And you know what? We got to start off with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't until the end that the disciples got that inspiration. We start with our baptism and the inspiration. So you are ready by the gospel. You are ready to do what the disciples did, and that's to set the world on fire. You know, I uh, had an experience in the last week, uh, lots of experiences, lots of them. But one I want to share with you today. And that was, I was waiting to get on the plane in Phoenix to go to Juno. And I was waiting for my son-in-law. I was sitting there, and there was a young couple sitting next to me. And we struck up a conversation, and we talked. Um, they were from Anchorage. And then it was time to go. And as I left, I felt um, I missed something there. And I recognized that I really didn't take the opportunity to share the light that shines in me. And so I thought, what would I do differently? And I had the chance to do that. So I happened to be in uh, the airport in, in um, not Juneau, but in Seattle. And there I went to look for lunch and they have a food court. And I got my lunch and it, it's, it was crowded. And I saw a table and there was a young man there and he, he was looking down, I don't know, he was working on his, his phone or something. And I, said, I said, can I sit here? And he said, yeah. So, um, so I was sitting there eating my lunch and um, I just about ready to finish my lunch and he looked up and he, you know, it's really hard to understand people with masks on. Do you know that? Do you get that? So anyway, I finally figured out he was telling me to put my mask on. <laughs> okay. So um, and then he asked me what I was doing. And I said, well, okay. Now I remembered the opportunity I had missed before, and I'm not going to miss the opportunity again. So I said, I'm a Christian pastor, and I brought five guys up into Alaska to help a town that needs some help and to work. And he looked at me, and he said, really? <laughs> he said, that's cool. And then I looked at my watch, and my plane was about ready to get going. It was like, oh, no. <laughs> and I had to leave. And you know, I left, I, I, I left feeling cheated. I wanted to be able to share more with him. I wanted to be able to tell him about Jesus Christ. I wanted to let the Holy Spirit work through me. But there it was. That's what I had the chance to do, is to tell him that I was a Christian pastor and took four other guys up into Alaska to help out a small community. And you know, the Holy Spirit will do what he would with that particular little conversation. But I tell you, I was prepared. I was prepared because of my, well, I call it a mistake, but inadequacy. You see, each one of us can have those same experiences where something happens and we go, oh, I should have done that differently. Do you ever have that? But sometimes we just say that and we just kind of let it go. But what you need to do is you need to say, I'm going to remember that, and I'm going to do something different. And God gave me that opportunity to do that. And you know, here's also what I'm learning about God, is that we don't have to create opportunities. He kind of lays them in our lap. All we have to do is recognize it. <clears throat> 
And then know that we've been prepared for it. And know that the Lord is bringing it. And then you take the opportunity and let the Holy Spirit work through you. You know, you don't have to say, well, I'm not ready yet. Let me tell you, if you're sitting in here, you're ready. You are all ready to do this. You are ready when the moment comes to share your faith. Are you ready to say what your faith is? Do you have something worked up? Do you know how you will respond? If someone asks you, are you a Christian? What are you doing? You see, I had that wonderful opportunity to kind of, I had a great lead in. Yeah, well, I'm going to serve, serve a small community. What a great lead in. And so each one of us, it's, it's an opportunity for us to think about when we might have a lead in to be able to share what started on Pentecost. <clears throat> now, we don't have to have tongues of fire on us. We don't have to speak in a foreign language. All we need is, well, I'll tell you, you know, Lutherans kind of shy away from this word, pastors. You know, it, it has a stigmatism. But let me tell you, this is, this is where, where we need to be. You need to be obedient. You need to be obedient unto God because this is what he has for you to do. <clears throat> so you need to be committed. You need to be steadfast. And you need to know that <clears throat> you have to have urgency because this person that you are talking to that you can share the gospel with, who knows what's going to happen a little while later. They may need to hear that gospel in that minute. We need to feel that. It's the day of Pentecost. It's the day the Holy Spirit showed up. <clears throat> it's the day the Christian church came into being. It's the day when the Holy Spirit lit the fires inside those disciples. And you and I, everyone, are part of that same fire today. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand now.